All right, y'all. So I wanted to talk about these two studies that have been published on train to failure in their relation to relationship to strength and hypertrophy gains. And this is important to me because I think a simple message is kind of going around on the internet and these studies are complex. So let's, let's talk about them. I'm going to screen share. We're just going to, we're just going to jam. So these studies are out of East Tennessee state university. looks like out of this stone lab. And the first study was published in 2018. This was primarily looking at strength findings. And so these, these are the same people. This is the same. This is just a different analysis. Um, same subjects. And so the protocol was looking at rep, max, rep maxes. So not really using the rep max protocol was three sets. And on the final set, they went to failure, which is kind of the opposite, similar to Brian Mann's protocol, auto regulatory protocol, where you go to failure on the first set and then have volume sets after that. And then you auto regulate off that first set. So this is a little bit different. And then they have this relative intensity group, which is, which is really weird. And it's hard. It's kind of hard to figure out. They have a longitudinal trans transducer, uh, which is like a gym wear unit. I, I can't really tell what they did, but we can go through it. And so this is, this is their block. This is their training schematic. And so this rep, these relative intensity group, they are, this doesn't mean that they're lifting 80% of their one rep max for three sets of 10. It means that they are lifting 80% of their, I think their 10 rep historical max. So that's a lot, lot different. Whereas these guys are consistently just blowing it out on that last set. And this day three is intentionally made very light. Uh, so that, so it has this, it's a, it's a lot different. So these two schematics are a lot different. And then we look down at the exercise selection and we see, all right, these are big boy lifts. These are, you know, we're pretty much all compound movements except for a DB tricep extension. Uh, also the volume is really, really low, which, I, which I found interesting. So this, this would definitely favor the strength because they're having less velocity drop-offs. They're you do, generally if you're training for strength, you don't want to train to failure. It's a bad idea. Um, and so, look at this. Let's, let's just think about overall quad volume on because that's the that's their vastus lateralis is their main outcome for hypertrophy. Uh, they had all these. They had strength is going to win. So this this study is done in a way where for strength you would expect and for all the neurological changes of strength you would expect the relative intensity group to win it's set up for them to win i can't even tell so there's this taper thing where you go three triples uh these guys are doing three triples at 90 percent of their triple max i don't know what the hell's going on here but then these guys i can't figure out if they tapered their training strengths their training strain went down, but if they're still doing, you know, on that third set, if they're still taking a triple to failure, that's terrible. That's still not a deload. Um, so there might be some confounding there. And then on top of that, we look at from a hypertrophy standpoint. So that's the next paper that was published in 2019. So I'm, I wouldn't argue that we would expect the relative intensity group, given the body of literature, we'd expect that to win, win in terms of strength. Now, in terms of hypertrophy, Here's where we get into trouble. So the quad volume, because that's their main outcome is vastus lateralis. Quad volume is, dude, six sets per week. So nothing. Uh, and, and then you have your only quad volume is a back squat. So that's not a lot of sets. So these guys, how trained are they? I can't really tell. Um, it, it's, it, you don't have that information. Uh, you do What you do have is you have that, their volume was the same. So these guys, we would not, given this, so this is not included in the, in the paper on hypertrophy, their volume is the same. So we would not expect, maybe, maybe the effect of this would be interesting, and maybe the effective reps of that rep max group, maybe the effective reps would be higher. Um, but overall, they're just, they're just going to the well and they're digging themselves in a pretty big hole where this, where this other group is not. And so, we would, we, where I would think training to failure would be advantageous for hypertrophy is if it resulted in an increase in training volume. And where would we potentially see that is if you did not use all compound movements. Like, yes, taking a back squat twice a week to failure is going to be terrible, right? But now if I take that back squat to an eight or nine RP or one or two reps in reserve every time and I have, and that, that's not as bad and you're not going to have the same rep drop off. Um, now if 
Whereas if you have a single joint movement and you take that to failure, that you generally don't have big drop-offs there. So if I was going to set up a study that was in favor of retinaxes, and that's what I think should be done in that sense, is you would have, you would have limited compound movements and then you would, tra- you, would, you're, you would essentially train in single joint movements to failure. And that would potentially over time, in, and we might not even be able to see this, remember in the time domain, you might not even be able to see this in 12 weeks. We're talking years where those, the, the increase in effective reps, the increase in training volume may be helpful for you. But this is a suboptimal program for hypertrophy. Let's, let's admit that. And then they did not find any differences in muscle thickness in this group. So here's, here we have the same, same study design because it's the same study. And then if we go down to their graphs here, they did some CSA stuff, so type one. They did uh, they did a biopsy. I would I would just point you to Schoenfeld's work on that, and and these are going to be tough. These aren't going to extrapolate very well to um, whole muscle hypertrophy. So interesting, maybe something going on here, maybe maybe not. Uh, I would I would really really focus on this muscle thickness, and they only chose the vastus lateralis, which is a little bit odd to me. Why would you not show triceps? Why would you not show other, why would you not show chest? Why would you not show these other things where you have more training volume for them? And so their muscle thickness here, uh, you can see they both, they both increased and the, there was no significant difference between the groups at baseline. So this group looked to be a little bit bigger at baseline. These aren't centimeters. Um, so they're, they're using an ultrasound to find muscle thickness or cross-sectional area of the vastus lateralis. Very common measurement in, in this field. All right. So Here's my big, here's the big hiccup for me. All right, so you see this, not, this doesn't look like a big win for anyone. We wouldn't expect a big win here, but then you go down this table and this number right here, this 3.62 is not the same number as right here. So that, that just seems like a big typo that should have been caught by reviewers. So if I'm looking at these studies and I'm really thinking about them, I'm not jumping off, you know, I'm not jumping to this conclusion that training to failure is terrible all the time. I think that's the wrong conclusion to make. I think training to failure with compound exercises, compound bar load ballers is going to get you in trouble. But I don't think that training to maximizing training volume, utilizing the single joint movements to maximize the, the amount of sets that you can do in a week. I don't, that's a very different question. And these studies don't answer that question. So let's, let's take into account. Let's think about what these studies do answer. If you're going to train to strength and you are an athlete and you're also sprinting, it's probably not a good idea to train to failure with compound movements. Okay, great. Got it. Now, if you are a hypertrophy athlete, I think you want to do everything in terms of training frequency, training to failure, uh, training not to failure, exercise selection. I think you want to do everything that you can to maintain your training volume over the long term. Uh, and that to me is, is pushing things towards more, getting the bulk of your volume through more of these single joint movements uh, and not crushing yourself with compound lifts over, over large periods of blocks. Not to say that you can't go, that it wouldn't be worthwhile going for, you know, three to four weeks training to failure a little bit. I think that is advantageous because it's going to increase your, some people want to do that psychologically. So giving them that is, it, that can be helpful. Um, but just let's not be black and white. Let's not be myopic and let's really think about these studies and we honestly don't know how trained they are. Just from the fact that they got hypertrophy from six sets of back squats a week makes me a little leery. And also, um, if you're taking uh, clean grip mid-thigh pulls to failure, I think we have a problem. And if you're doing that for 10 straight weeks, I think you're going to have an even bigger problem. So, pura vida, nos vemos, see you later.